So tonight, I want to talk to you about overcoming disappointment. Uh, as I talk to people, you know, oftentimes I get a feel of the pulse of where the church is at. You know, you sit down with people in spiritual guidance sessions, or you meet people out there in the foyer, and you start to hear the prayer requests, and you read through the different things that are coming across the emails. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of people in our church specifically that I know right now have had some really bad news that are going through financial pressures and problems. A lot of people who don't know how they're going to make it, whether it be physically, emotionally, uh, financially, they don't know what they're going to do. They don't know what the plan is. And and they've been just handed uh, some devastating news. I can't tell you how many people on the prayer list that I read and prayed for today had a report of some sort of cancer, some stage four. Some people lost loved ones to stage four cancer. Some people are just dealing with it currently, or they just got the report. It's amazing. There's been devastating news that's been handed out. I was looking through recent news. I, you know, I, I don't stay up on the news. I don't watch the news regularly. And, and I had some time after my devotions. I knew that I was spiritually in a good place with God after my devotional time, after my prayer time. I said, I'm going to check out what's going on on the earth. And I saw, you know, these, these things that are going on in the earth, wars in Syria and different things like that, that, you know, people should be outraged about. And when they showed these things happening in Bosnia and other places, there was an outcry and things were happening. But for some reason, it's going long. It's, it's continuing on. It's been years. And these are things that can discourage us and can disappoint us. When we see things on the earth, or when we experience things, and we wonder, what's God doing? Where's God at? And why hasn't this been taken care of yet? What is the process? What is the plan, God? What are you doing? Maybe some of you in this room have felt the same way. 1 Kings chapter number 19 is a story that comes right after a great victory. There's a great battle that takes place up on Mount Carmel. Here, Elijah the prophet, the great man of God who comes and declares that there will be a famine. There will be no rain on the land except at his word. He steps up to the king of Israel, who is a wicked king named Ahab. And here he steps up again, and he's, he's told, it's time to go show yourself. And so he goes out, and, and he calls a meeting up on Mount Carmel. In fact, really, he throws down the, the glove, right? He, he just kind of says, hey, let's, let's have a battle. We'll pray to our gods. Whoever's God answers with fire, that's the true and living God. So there's one prophet of God up on the mountain, 450 prophets of Baal. Here they have this great meeting where they have a, a sacrifice on wood. They... they, they call out to their God Baal, and, and they, they're crying out, crying out. They're raising their voices, that sort of a thing. And eventually, Elijah starts kind of chastening them a little bit. He starts joking with them, and he says, maybe he's asleep. Maybe you need to shout louder. And so they jump up and down. They cut themselves and all this kind of stuff. And finally, when, when it's recognized and realized that Baal's not going to answer by fire, Elijah steps up and says, okay, pour some water on it. Dig a trough around it. And they pour water on the sacrifice. And he says, do it again. They do it again. And he calls on the name of the Lord. He prays to God, and God answers with fire out of the heavens. It burns up the sacrifice, burns up the wood. It licks up all the fire in the trough around it. Now, some of you guys are clapping because that's an amazing thing, isn't it? God answers. Here's this great victory. He says, seize all the prophets of Baal, 450 of them. He slaughters them by the brook. He tells the king, get ready, go up and eat and drink because there's going to be rain. Now, there wasn't a cloud in the sky at this time. He goes and he prays, and many of you know the story. He's, he just goes down on his, on his face before the Lord, puts his head down between his knees, and he starts to fervently pray. And we know that even though Elijah had a nature like ours, he prayed and the Lord answered. It didn't happen suddenly. It didn't happen right away. He had to go back seven times, send a servant back seven different times. And eventually, the servant saw a little teeny tiny cloud off in the distance coming up over the sea that looked like the size of a man's fist. Elijah says, that's our answer. Let's get going. Now, before they could get down the hill, it was already starting to rain. Spirit of God comes on Elijah, and he outruns the chariots of the king down the mountain. It's an amazing story. It's an amazing thing that happens. Now, the king obviously met up with his wife, who was a wicked woman named Jezebel. Okay, Jezebel was the most wicked of all the queens. In fact, in the book of Revelation... You find her name used as a curse. Her name is used to deceive people. And, and so here she is, and, and Ahab, who is the wickedest, wickedest king, talks to his wicked wife, and she sends a message to Elijah saying, far be it from me if, if this doesn't happen this time tomorrow. In fact, let me read it to you in, in 1 Kings chapter number 19. Verse number two, she hears the word and says, Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. In other words, I'm going to kill you, and I'm going to cut you in pieces, just like you slaughtered all of the prophets of Baal. 
even though they lost, even though this should have been a time for the king of Israel to step up and make reforms in the land where he says, hey, listen, we know who the true God is. We all just witnessed a miracle. He should have stepped up to his wife and said, you're not going to do that. This is the one true living God. I saw the fire come down out of heaven. I saw the man of God pray and the rain came down. But what does he do? He lets his wife send a message to the prophet that she's going to kill him. Now, Elijah, again, was a man with a nature like ours. And this news probably sent shivers down his spine. And so the Bible tells us that he ran. Drop down to verse number four. Look at this. It says, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He, he, he runs 100 miles away. Now, this time the Spirit of God is not on him. Okay, he goes down to a place called Beersheba. It was the southernmost city in Judah. Why is that important? Because remember, Ahab was the king of Israel. Israel was the northern territory. It was the northern tribes that had split off from the two tribes of Judah and Benjamin. So he runs out of the territory of Ahab and out of the territory of Jezebel, out of their jurisdiction, and he goes as far as he can into friendly territory. There he drops his servant off, the one who he kept sending up to take a look and see if there was any clouds in the sky. He leaves him there, and it says that he journeyed even further into the wilderness. And it says this, and he came and sat down under a broom tree, and he prayed that he might die. Maybe you've been discouraged. Maybe after a great victory, there's been a great devastating blow that's come to you. Maybe in life you've been handed a pink slip or you've been handed divorce papers. Maybe you were served. Maybe something took place in your life that there was a dis- disappointment and a discouragement. You found yourself in that same position, lying under a tree, praying and asking God that you might die. Why? Why should I even be here? What, what's, what's the point, God? Why should I go on any further? He's discouraged. He's depressed. And he says, it's enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Remember that when he talks about the fathers, he's not just talking about his dad and his grandpa. He's talking about the people who went before him. The nation of Israel never had a righteous king. They only had wicked kings. In fact, during the time of the judges, you can find how the people rebelled against God. And he says, I'm no better than any of them, even though we just had a great victory, even though we just proved that you're God, I'm still a sinful man. And he's despondent, he's discouraged, and he prays that he might die. Now, maybe you've heard this story before. Let me just give you some details because I want to get to where we're going tonight. Elijah, the Bible says that as he's there, he falls asleep. He's physically exhausted. You can imagine, uh, you know, here he is when the spirit of the Lord comes on him and he runs. He's got energy. He's got strength. But now he's running in fear for his life. He goes 100 miles away to Beersheba, drops off his servant, and then goes a day's journey into the wilderness. There he is. He's physically exhausted. He falls asleep. The Bible says an angel of the Lord kicks him in the side, says, wake up, you need to eat and drink. And he wakes up, and there's a jar of water, and there's some cakes burning on some coals. And so he eats, and he falls asleep. The angel wakes him up again and says, no, you need to eat some more because the journey's too great for you, where you're going. So he wakes up, he eats, and he drinks again, and he falls back asleep. Now, when he gets up, the Bible says that he goes in the strength of that food that the angel had given him for 40 days and 40 nights. There's a supernatural thing that takes place in his life. He gets the provision of God, he eats it, he drinks, and now he can go in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights. He goes down to Mount Horeb, or the other term for that, maybe you guys know it better, is Mount Sinai. It's where the Lord delivered the law to Moses. This is the place where the Lord came and hid Moses in the cleft of the rock and let him see his hind parts, let him see his glory. This is the place where the, the law was delivered to the people, and they sat, and they ate, and they drank, and they saw the Lord. So here he goes to a very significant place. The prophet, this is the one who never died. This is the great Elijah. This is the one who called down fire out of heaven and called rain out of the sky. Here he is in the place where the Lord delivered the law to Moses, a very significant place, very spiritual place, and he goes into a cave. Now, I don't know, it could have been the same cave that Moses was hidden because it says he came to the cave. So that may mean that he came to the very same cave that God visited Moses in. And here he is in this cave and he prays. And he says, God, here I am, you know, what am I supposed to do? And the Lord says, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he says, you know what, they, they, they've, I've been very zealous for the Lord, and, and yet they, they've, they've killed your prophets, and now they seek to take my life too. And, then, and the Bible says, he's, prepare yourself because I'm going to come. And you know the story, here comes a great wind and it breaks apart rocks. I mean, what kind of wind breaks apart rocks? That's pretty amazing wind, isn't it? Then an earthquake happens, and it shakes the foundation of this mountain. That would be pretty scary, being on the top of a mountain in the middle of an earthquake, don't you think? 
And so it says that God shook that mountain, and yet God's voice was not in the wind. It was not in the earthquake. Then finally, fire breaks out. Maybe it was lightning strikes. Maybe it was just fire coming down on the mountain because the Lord showed up. And that's the same thing that happened because the Bible tells us that the hills melt like wax before the presence of the Lord. So here God is showing up, and yet it says his voice was not in the fire. And then a still, small voice or a little gentle whisper comes. And Elijah wraps his face in the mantle that he wears, and he goes out before the Lord. God asks him the question another time. He says, what are you doing here, Elijah? Verse number 14, and he said, I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life also. Here he is, and he starts telling the Lord, God, I've been good. I've done the right things. And yet, God, I'm still disappointed. Maybe some of you in this place have felt like you've done everything right. Maybe you felt like I've been serving the Lord. I've been tithing, and yet I still feel like there's a devourer coming after my finances. Anybody can identify with that? I know just recently my wife and I, we, we moved into a new house, and it seems like, you know, we overpaid this bill, and we can't get the money back. And then we ordered these things, and then we canceled the order, but they sent them anyways. And then we said, well, hey, you made a mistake, and we want to send them back and get our money back. And they said, okay, go ahead and pay for shipping, but the shipping costs as much as the items. It's like, come on, that's ridiculous. You made a mistake, and now I have to pay for it. No, it's not going to happen, and now we're fighting with them. And then all of a sudden, my wife tells me, hey, we need to take the car, and something's going on with the AC. And it's like, oh, my goodness, of course something's going on in the AC. Well, at least it's winter, kind of. (laughs) My goodness. And the devourer starts coming, but I know we tithe, because, man, every first, every 15th, my wife is there texting our tithe in. Boom, it's gone. It's there, electronically zapped. First things first, man, we're bringing our tithe to God. Why? Because God will rebuke the devourer. So what's going on, God? See, we all deal with disappointments. Maybe you took care of your body. Maybe you were healthy, and you still got sick. Maybe you felt like you did everything right in the relationship, and they still turned their back on you. Whatever it is, realize that this can come to all of us. Jesus said these words. He said, in the world, you will have trouble. You don't have to believe God for some of the promises. They're just going to happen. You know what I'm saying? You don't have to confess those things over your life. It's just going to happen. And for all of us, we need to understand that we see principles in what takes place in Elijah's life. Because God starts to speak to Elijah. He starts to speak the plan. He starts to speak the purpose. starts to tell him what's going on. And it goes on, and God starts to tell him, hey, listen, here's what I want you to do. Okay? After Elijah says all this stuff, God says, okay, I want you to go and I want you to anoint uh, Ben-Hadad as king over Israel. I want you to anoint Jehu as king. Uh, or, I'm sorry, Ben-Hadad as king over Syria. I want you to anoint Jehu over, over Israel. And then I want you to go and anoint Elisha in your place. And so then he says these words. Listen to this. He says, yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. God says, Elijah, you're not the only one. You're sitting here crying. You want to die. And you've ran all the way out here to have some time alone with me. Here's the time. Here's the plan. Here's what's going to take place. God had a plan, and God had people reserved. And God tells Elijah, you're not the only one. Now, first of all, even if Elijah was the only one, he wouldn't have been the only one, right? Why? Because God is with him. Wherever he goes, God would never leave nor forsake his people. That is a promise that we can find in the word of God, and we know that God was with them. We know that God was confirming his words with miracles and signs and wonders from the heavens. My goodness, if anybody would at that time been able to say God's with me, it would have been Elijah. He's never alone. But even if you're the one person on the earth, you and God makes a majority right there. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to wonder about it. Why? Because if God is on your side, who then can be against you? If God is for you, what can man do to you? See, here's a man, and he's in despondency, he's in despair, he says, I'm the only one, right? And and it's almost like he's singing, nobody knows the trouble I see. At the time, Jesus hadn't come, so it would be, nobody knows but me, right? And God says, don't worry about it. You're not alone. I've got a plan, and I've got people, Elijah. And in this story, I see a couple of things about overcoming disappointment. If we're going to overcome in this area of our lives, because it's going to come to all of us. In the world, you will have trouble. At times, things aren't going to work out the way that you wanted them to. The deal's not going to come through. The, the, you know, the stock market's going to start getting volatile. I love the, the words that they start to, the stock market is really volatile, right? All of a sudden, everybody's freaking out, and the news is making all this stuff. But listen, if God's with you, who cares? 
If you lost some money, God will get you more money. It's a replenishable resource. In the natural, it will grow wings and fly away. Anybody experience that other than me, right? You know, you thought you had money, and then all of a sudden, boop, it's gone. You're still here today. Haven't missed a meal. Some of us could stand to miss a meal every now and then, right? Because why? God has a plan, and God has people. So if we're going to overcome disappointment, how do we do this? First one is this. Don't make decisions based on disappointment. Don't make a decision based on the disappointment. When you start making decisions based on your disappointments, you start making the wrong decisions. Can anybody say amen to that? Right? You had something happen. You said, well, fine. That's it. I'm just going to go have a drink. Hello? Wrong decision. Wow, if that's how they're going to act, then I'm going to give them a piece of my mind. Wrong decision. You know, it's like going shopping when you're hungry. Anybody ever done that before? You said, bad decision, Pastor. I did not double coupon, and I ended up with way too much stuff in the basket, things that I didn't need, things that I didn't want. I let the kids go and get whatever they want because I was hungry for them, right? And they loaded up the basket and started singing my praise, and we had to dance through the grocery store until I got to the checkout stand, and I got the bill, and I had to... It's the same thing when you're disappointed. You start going around shopping for what to do when you're disappointed, you're going to end up with the wrong things in your life. We need to understand that we need to slow down when we're disappointed. We need to seek God and make wise decisions. Don't make decisions based on disappointments. I love the story of Moses and the children of Israel. There's this, this interplay between Moses and the children of Israel the whole time he's leading them. You know, Moses as a leader was an amazing man. God used him to do some mighty things. In fact, the Bible records, and Moses was writing this, so it's almost like Moses was talking about himself. And it says, now Moses was very meek. In fact, the meekest man on the earth. Can you imagine someone saying, I'm the most humble, right? That's basically essentially what Moses was saying. But he was under the authority of the Holy Spirit, so we know it was true. So Moses, this meek man, he's dependent on God. He's leaning on God, and God uses him to part the Red Sea, uses him to make bitter water sweet waters, uses him that the rock is struck and water pours out of it, all this stuff. But Moses was a man just like you and me, and Moses had emotions. Moses at times had to pitch his tent outside the camp because he couldn't deal with the people all that much. He had to go visit with God. Moses had times where he'd get angry. You know, he couldn't even see the promised land because he struck the rock twice. He didn't listen to what God said. See, Moses is as natural a man as you and me. And there was a point in Moses' life when a disappointment happened. He was walking through the camp, and he heard something. The people started bawling and squalling. They were moaning and groaning over what? The fact that they had no meat. Let's take a look at it in Numbers chapter number 11. If you want to turn back there with me, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and find the book of Numbers chapter number 11. And in Numbers chapter number 11, I'm going to read verse number 10 through verse number 16. Look at what it says. Now, the people had plenty to eat. In fact, the people got to eat manna. You say, what's that? Exactly. That's what the translation of manna is. is what is it? It was a, a small kind of a dew that fell out of the sky that was like coriander seed and honey mixed together, sort of like wafers. And it would fall on the ground. They would gather it up, and they could eat it. Then the Bible records in the book of John, the gospel of John, that this was angel food. This was the bread of angels. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? They're eating angel food cake every morning. That's just like the best, isn't it? And here they are complaining about having dessert every day, all day long. When we were kids, we would have loved that. So it says in verse number 10, Then Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families, everyone at the door of his tent, and the anger of the Lord was greatly aroused. Moses also was displeased. Right? He had a disappointment. He had a discouragement in his life. He was not happy about what he heard because the people were crying at the doors of their tent. Verse 11, So Moses said to the Lord, Why have you afflicted your servant? Now notice, Moses calls himself God's servant. Sounds very familiar, doesn't it? Here's Elijah saying, I have been very zealous for the Lord. Moses starts to commend himself. Why have you afflicted your servant? And why have I not found favor in your sight that you have laid the burden of all these people on me? Verse 12, did I conceive all these people? Did I beget them that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a guardian carries a nursing child to the land which you swore to their fathers? Verse 13, where am I to get meat to give all these people? For they weep all over me saying, give us meat that we may eat. That sounds like a chant, doesn't it? Give us meat that we may eat. Give us meat that we may eat. That would drive me nuts too. Verse number 14, I'm not able to bear all these people alone. Oh, well, once again, here he is in the midst of a discouragement, making statements, making choices. 
about what he perceives life to be like. I'm the only one, God. I've, I've, I've got the burden of these people on myself alone. Forget about my brother Aaron the priest. Forget about all the Levites that you've set up. Forget about your spirit, your presence that's with us. The cloud by day and the fire by night. Forget it. It's just me, God. I'm all alone and probably saying in the quartet with Elijah later on in heaven, nobody knows. I'm not able to bear all these people alone because the burden is too heavy for me. Verse 15, if you treat me like this, please kill me. Here and now. That's a pretty direct prayer, isn't it? Thank God he doesn't answer every single one of our stupid prayers right when we ask for them, right? Because they would destroy us. Even the ones that we think would be good. God, give me a million dollars. You would blow it and then you would be mad about it the next day. Like, God, could I have another million dollars? He says, God, please kill me here and now. Just like Elijah, right? Only he's a little bit more angry about it. And it says, now if I have found favor in your sight and do not let me see my wretchedness. Now, notice what God says to Moses, okay? Remember, Elijah, God had a plan, and God had people, right? Very next verse, verse 16, so the Lord said to Moses, gather to me 70 men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people, and officers over them. Bring them to the tabernacle of meeting, that they may stand there with you. Notice God says, I've got a plan, and I've got people. Once again, I've got a plan, and I've got people. There's a reoccurring theme here that I need you guys to get a hold of, is that in the midst of discouragement, don't make decisions. Why? Because God has a plan, and God has people. In your life, think about it for a second. When you're discouraged, don't make wrong choices. Why? Because God has a plan, and God has people. You say, well, what does that mean? That means that God knows what he's going to do. He knows the process. He knows what he's going to do to take you out of the trial that you're in the midst of. And he also has resources, and he's going to use people to bring those resources into your life. God has a plan, and God has people. In other words, God's got it under control, baby. All you got to do is listen to his voice and follow his direction. Come on, somebody. That's good news. Why? Because God wants to talk to you about your life. God wants to deliver to you the plan as you pray. And he goes on and he talks to them about them bearing the load, bearing the weight. And then God gives the people enough meat so much so he says, it's going to come out of your nostrils. God, you know, gets them back for all the whining and complaining and crying and chanting for Moses' sake, right? He gets them back and, and, and eventually with meat in the midst of their teeth, some of the people fell out and died. Some of you guys are crazy because you're laughing about that. But what's the point? You're not alone. God always has a plan, and he always has a people. God is with you always, but also you're not the only one. You know, even in the New Testament, it talks about this. Turn with me kind of towards the back of your Bible, the first Peter, okay? If you hit Revelation, come back. If you hit the maps, you've gone way too far. And come back to first Peter. And in first Peter, the last chapter in first Peter, first Peter chapter number five, He's talking about the devil coming against their lives. He says, I want you to resist him. Stand fast, firm in the faith. And then in verse number 9 and verse number 10, he says these words. In 1 Peter 5, verse number 9, it says, Resist the devil steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Do you know that you're not the only one? You're not the only one who's dealing with disappointments. You're not the only one that's dealing with lack. You're not the only one who's dealt with discouragement or depression. People all over the world are going through trials and problems. And guess what? Probably most of them worse than us. We're pretty blessed in the United States of America. You know what I mean? There's still places on the earth that don't have a single translation of the Bible in their language. Hello. We're pretty blessed, aren't we? There's churches that would love to be able to gather like this openly without fear of somebody busting down the door and putting a gun to their heads and telling them to renounce Christ or they're going to jail or worse. There's places where it's illegal to speak the name of Jesus. We're pretty blessed. So it says resist the devil. The trials that you're going through, you can make it. You can take it. Why? Because God's with you, and he's got a plan, and he's got a people. Resist him because your brotherhood and all the world is experiencing the same sufferings and the same trials. But look at the next verse. It says, but may the God of all grace. Now, stop right there for a second. We've got we to gotta just linger on this point for a second. It says, may the God of all grace. Now, sometimes we think grace is just for salvation. We think that's just something that when I get saved, it's by grace you've been saved through faith, right? That not of yourself is the gift of God. So this is something that's unmerited favor for me to get saved. Yes, that's absolutely true, but it does not stop there. Because God is not just the grace for salvation. 
God is the God of all grace. God is the God of all grace. God is the God of grace for sustenance, for sustaining your life. God is the God of strength, to strengthen your life. God is the God of source, to resource everything that you have need of. God is the God that gives you a multifaceted grace that fits every need and every problem and every trial and every pressure. If there's a problem, if there's persecution coming your way, guess what? God will give you the grace, the strength to be able to bear it. Grace is God's sovereign divine ability to get the job done on my behalf when I can't do it. What does that mean? That means that God is the God of all grace. He's going to deliver to you the strength that you need for the situation that you're facing. I should have a bigger clap and a bigger amen than that. Because that means something to your life. That means that whatever problem, whatever trial, whatever discouragement you're going through right now, there is a grace that's available for you to be able to stand up under that pressure. That means that you don't have to lie down and pray and ask God that you can die any longer. You can stand up and declare the word of the Lord that guess what, devil? I don't have to put up with your stuff anymore. I can take it because God's with me. God has a plan and God has a people. Verse number 10 goes on. Now may the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? After you have suffered a while. God, did you have to put that in the Bible? Don't you wish we could just have like some, some, some spiritual whiteout and just kind of just mark that part out? After I've suffered, why do I got to go through suffering? Why? Because you're following the footsteps of Jesus. Jesus went through suffering and afterward to glory. It's no different for his body. It's no different for his brethren. It's no different for his children. We're all following in the footsteps of Jesus. You want to look like Jesus, go through suffering. You want to look like Jesus, go through suffering well with the grace of God on your life because God has a plan and God has a people. Look at what it goes on to say. After you have suffered a while, perfect. Ooh, we, we want to be perfect, don't we? We all like that one. Establish. I want to be established, immovable. Strengthen. I'm pretty weak right now. I could use some strength. And settle you. You don't have to be frustrated. You don't have to be all up at arms about everything. You don't have to be running around, right? You can be settled. You can have peace in the midst of every storm and every problem, every trial. Why? Because the grace of God is available to you. And after you've suffered, God will do all of these things in your life. Can somebody say amen to that? So what do you do in the meantime? Well, you do what Elijah did. Pour out your heart before the Lord. Pour out your heart before the Lord. Did you know that God is not intimidated by what's going on on the inside of you? Sometimes people think they can't talk to God, you know, because God, you know, you got to approach God in a certain way. And and don't get me wrong, you never disrespect God, okay? Don't go there. Do not ever confront God. Don't tempt God. Don't test God. You don't talk to God a certain way. Yes, I, I, I get that. But if you think that you can't tell God that you're angry and he'll understand, you're wrong. If you, can't, if you think that you can't tell God how frustrated you are, how sad you are, how discouraged you are, how despondent you are, you are wrong. Because when I read my Bible, I find people pouring out their complaint before the Lord. And guess what? God is not in therapy. He's not taking Prozac. He's not worried about what he's going to do. Man, I really didn't know that they were like this. Like, they've got problems. God is not doing God, God already knows what's going on on the inside of your heart. And he already has a plan, and he's already got a people. But God wants you to pour out your complaint before him. That's why God asked, what are you doing here, Elijah? It wasn't for God's benefit, like, hey, why did you show up, you know? No, God knew why he was there. God knew the path that he took. What was God doing? See, God never asked a question for his own benefit. He asked it for our benefit, because God is the one who tells the end from the beginning. God is the one who sees past into the hidden things of the heart. God is the one with whom everything is naked and bare and exposed before him, with whom we have to give an account. See, God never asked us a question for his benefit. He's all-knowing. God asked the question for our benefit. And so when he asked him, what are you doing here, Elijah? It was so that Elijah had an opportunity to open up to bear his spirit before the Lord and to start to pour out what was on the inside of him. God, I've, I've served you. I've been very zealous. But God, they broke your covenant. See, that bugged Elijah, and it should bug him. The people that I have prophesied to, the people that saw your miracles, the people that saw the signs and wonders, the ones who should have woken up and reformed and amended their ways, these are the very people who have broken your covenant. 
And he says, I alone am left. In other words, God, I'm feeling like it's just me out here, and I need some help. And they seek to kill me too. There's something going on, God, something taking place. Do you see what's going on? Of course God sees. God revealed to him right after that the plan and revealed to him the people. In the same way, it's no different in your life. God, I'm discouraged. God, I prayed and it didn't happen. God, I asked and you said to ask and I saw it in your word and yet I still don't see it. I don't understand what's going on. God, I shouldn't be this much need. There shouldn't be this much lack. God, where's the abundance that you talk about? See, God is not intimidated by our questions or our concerns, but God doesn't want us to doubt or fear. There's a difference. And if you want to know what this looks like in your Bible, I just want to give you a couple of scriptures to write down, and I want you to read them and meditate on them, okay? A uh, couple of, of, of scriptures, all right? The first one is Psalm 102, okay? Just read that one in its entirety, okay? And listen to the words, listen to the language, listen to the things that are being poured out. It talks about people that are overwhelmed. And then I want you to read Psalm 142, okay? This is... King David speaking to God in a cave. Hello. Elijah was speaking to God in a cave. Here's David in a similar situation. And I want you to read through his words and find out where he concludes the psalm. Okay, so if any of you in this place are discouraged, I want you to take some time this week. This is your homework assignment, all right? And I want you to read those two psalms, Psalm 102 and Psalm 142, okay? Now, Psalm 42, verse 4 and verse number 5. Look at what it says. When I remember these things, I pour out my soul within me. Isn't that an amazing thought? Isn't that an amazing scripture? You can pour out what's on the inside of you before God. He says, for I used to go with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise, with the multitude and kept a pilgrim feast. Verse 5. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Look at where he concludes. Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. Another version says, I will yet praise my God, he who lifts my countenance. In other words, he starts talking to himself. Now, in, in the world, we think that only crazy people talk to themselves, right? But did you know that very sane people talk to themselves? Okay? Because here, the psalmist writes, and he says, so? Why so downcast? starts talking to himself. Why, why are you discouraged? He puts his life into perspective. Yeah, I used to go to the house of God. There used to be a lot of joy. I'm very discouraged right now. I'm disquieted. There's a tumult on the inside of me. And yet, why so downcast? Oh, my soul. He's talking to himself. And guess what? He's talking sense to himself. Because sometimes when you feel alone, like there's nobody out there, you're not going to listen to anybody else, but you will listen to yourself if you start talking some sense. Right? There may not be anybody around you to talk some sense into you, and sometimes your spirit man has to raise up and start talking to you and telling you what's right. Put your hope in God, for I shall yet praise him. In the midst of this trial, this problem, this circumstance, I'm going to lift up a voice that says God is good in the midst of bad, that God is great, and he's got a plan even when I don't see it. God's at work behind the scenes, even though I don't know what he's up to. He's up to something, and I know it's good. Come on. Got to talk to yourself. Got to stir yourself up. And as you do, he will lift your countenance. What does that mean, your countenance? That's, that's the way you look. You will go from down, depressed, and discouraged. And when you say, soul, why so downcast? Put your hope in God. For I will yet praise. See, notice your posture changes. Notice your whole countenance changes. You know, uh, people have studied in the natural smiling. Did you know that? And they've said it takes more muscles to frown than it does to smile. Now, that's one thing because no one likes exercise and you should not be using those frown muscles that much, okay? Because you're going to hurt yourself and it might get frozen there and that, that's just not good, okay? But they found out something else that, that there are literally chemicals released when you start to smile. There are things that happen on the, Try it out right now for a second. Just smile, okay? You guys are like, Pastor, this is weird. Yeah, it is. Go, go ahead and smile, all right? All right? Start smiling. Put a smile on your face. Okay, let's try this out. Everybody say, ha, ha, ha. Ho, ho, ho. He, he, he. Now, don't you feel better? 
Literally, anybody feel better since they started smiling? Look at this. Look at you guys, right? Maybe you came in tonight depressed, downcast, and discouraged, and on your way out tonight, when that foul spirit tries to rest on your shoulder and tell you that was a bunch of hubbub, that was a bunch of hooey, hey, why so downcast? Oh, why so? Put your hope in God and start to smile and say, ha, 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 ho, 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 he, 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 devil, you're a liar, and just start to praise your way home tonight, and God will lift your countenance all the way into next week. Come on. So if we're going to overcome, number one, don't make decisions while discouraged. Number two, pour out your heart before God. It's a good thing to do. God's not intimidated by it. He wants you to pour out your heart. On the road to Emmaus, right? Here's a couple disciples. They're discouraged. Jesus is dead. Jesus shows up and they don't know who he is. And what does Jesus do? He says, what, where are you guys going? Well, we, we were going on this way. Can I go with you? Yeah. Why are you guys so sad, Right? Jesus knows why, but he's asking the question for their benefit. Are you a stranger to these parts? Do you not know what happened? There was a great prophet, Jesus of Nazareth, and yet we thought that he was going to be the Messiah, the hope of Israel, and yet he was crucified. And Jesus starts to open up the scriptures to them and reveals himself to them when they get to the, the, the house, and all of a sudden, bang, their countenance is lifted. And what do they say? Did not our hearts burn within us? See, when you start to pour out your heart before God, God will pour his heart out on you, and he will light you on fire. Hallelujah. Give God a praise. Last thing for tonight is this. Last thing for tonight is this, is get going on the plan. Get going on the plan. God has a plan, and God has a people. God will supply the people as needed. God will supply the resource as needed. God knows how to get what he needs to get to your life. But he needs you to get going on the plan. You know, the Bible records in Elijah's story that after God told him the plan, that he left there on his way to Damascus. He anointed the kings, and then the very next story is what takes place when he takes his mantle and he throws it over Elisha, not Elijah, Elisha's shoulders while he's behind the twelve yoke of oxen. See, right away, Elijah didn't waste any time. He got going on the plan. There is no better way to get out of discouragement than to walk on the path of God's plan. When you know the will of God, all of a sudden you can have faith because that will of God is a picture of what your life is going to be like. When God says, I've got a plan for you, I've got a purpose, hey, look at, look at Elijah, right? He says, I want you to anoint this king, I want you to anoint that king, and I want you to anoint this prophet. See, there was something that was going on. Elijah realized this is much bigger than I am. This is nations now that he's impacting. This is legacy that's going to go on after him. Elijah knew that there was something that was going to take place that was larger than him, and God tells him, whoever escapes this king, this king's going to kill, and whoever escapes that king, the prophet's going to kill. I'm going to take them out, and I've got 7,000 reserved who have not bowed their knees to Baal. And so he realizes, wow, God's plan is much larger than what I thought. I thought I was all alone in the midst of this, but God says, no, you're not alone. I'm right here. I'm not worried about what's going to happen. I've already got a plan, and I've got people. And Elijah, I need you to get going on what I've called you to do. See, when you start to pour out your heart before the Lord, and God reveals to you his plan in the secret place, when you start to hear the whispers of Almighty God, not the fire, not the wind, not the breaking rocks, none of that stuff. When God shows up, not in the earthquake, no, when that still small voice, that whisper witnesses on the inside of you and you realize this is the plan of God, it's time to get going. Because as you get up and you get going, you leave that discouragement where you were sitting under the tree. You leave that discouragement in the cave where you were weeping and now you come out into the plan and the path and the destiny of God. God, and now all of a sudden you have overcome and you are on your way to purpose and destiny with God. <laughs> Brian L. Harbour writes in his book, Rising Above the Crowd, the year was 1920. The scene was an examining board for the selecting of missionaries. Standing before the board was a young man named Oswald Smith. One dream dominated his heart. He wanted to be a missionary. Over and over again, he prayed, Lord, I want to go out as a missionary for you. Open a door of service for me. Now at last, his prayer would be answered. When the examination was over, the board turned Oswald Smith down. He did not meet their qualifications. He failed the test. Now, Oswald Smith had set his direction, but now life gave him a detour. What would he do? You can imagine the discouragement of somebody. Lord, I just want to serve you. I want to be a missionary. I want to go. Lord, I want to do your work. I want to spread the gospel to the nations. And now here they say, no, 
you can't go. It says, as Oswald Smith prayed, God planted another idea in his heart. If he could not go out as a missionary, he would build a church which could send out missionaries. And that's what he did. Oswald Smith pastored the People's Church in Toronto, Canada, which sent out more missionaries than any other church at that time. Oswald Smith brought God into the situation and God transformed his detour into a main thoroughfare of service. See, guys, when you get into the presence of God and you pour out your heart before him, God starts to reveal to you the plan that he has for your life, the direction that he wants you to go, that he has a plan and he has a people. When you get moving on that plan, God will bless you with the grace that we talked about before, the grace for every situation, the grace that you need to get through, the grace that you need to overcome, the grace that you need for strength and for service, the grace that you need for sustenance, the grace that, that keeping grace, that strengthening grace, that grace that will take you further than you could ever go on your own. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, turn there with me, we'll conclude with this tonight. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, the Apostle Paul is writing, and he's talking about some things that have gone on that were discouraging. He'd gone through pressures, problems, trials, perils. I mean, this guy had opposition like you would not believe. There were people who considered themselves to be super apostles. If Apostle Paul's an apostle, then I'm a super apostle, Right? And they were, they were taking the church and they were, they were raising themselves up and drawing people away from faith in Jesus Christ. And look at what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 16 through verse number 18. It says, therefore, we do not lose heart. Let me read that to you again. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. Guys, the outward, the physical, the natural is not the place to keep your focus if you're only focused on numbers in an account, if you're only focused on who's there with you, if you're only focused on what things look like on the surface, you're going to be disappointed every time. But if you start to renew your inward man, the true you, the spirit man, in the presence of God, and you receive that grace and that strength for your life, day by day, it's going to make all the difference. Verse number 17, for our light affliction. Now stop right there for a second. This man had been snake bit. This man had been beaten. This man had been stoned to death. This man had been shipwrecked. This man spent days in the deep, in the ocean. He was just out there on a board from the ship that had been wrecked, waiting to go into shore. This man had people following him from city to city to city, trying to stop the work of God that was going on through his life. This man had problems, trials, pressures, and things that were taking place that none of us would want to endure. And yet he says, for our light affliction. Some of us are crying to God because they didn't have our brand of ice cream at the grocery store. But there are others in this place that you don't know where you're going to spend the night if the bill doesn't get paid. Some of you guys don't know what you're going to do. Some of you guys don't know how you're going to face the situation, and yet the Bible is still clear, and this is for you, and this is for me, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment. You know, the Bible tells us that our life is just a vapor. Even if every day of your life, if you live to be 150 years old, even if you live to be Methuselah, right? Even if you had a thousand years on this earth, when you compare that to eternity, it's still just a vapor. It's still just a flash in the pan. It's just for a moment. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, look at this, is working. Everybody say it's working. Come on, say it again. It's working. One more time. It's working. It's doing something. God's doing something. God has a plan and God has a people. Is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. There may be a weight of pressures on your life right now, but those pressures are working something in your life. They're working a far more exceeding and eternal. This, this affliction doesn't last, but the glory is going to last. This affliction's but a moment, but the glory is forever. This, this, this moment is passing, but eternity is staying. Look at this next verse, verse number 18. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. What does that mean? That means get going on the plan of God. No matter what you're facing, no matter the pain of the process, no matter the trial that you're going through, you're going to make it and you can take it. Even if on the earth you never get the answer that you wanted. Even if on the earth you never get the clarity that you desired. You never get the breakthrough. Listen, there were people in the Bible, you can read about them in Hebrews chapter number 11, that had promises from God that they never received while they were here on the earth. Because the Bible says they were looking to the eternal. 
They sought a country, not here on the earth, that is temporary and earthly and natural, but they sought the heavenly, and they put their faith in the eternal God. Guys, whatever you're going through tonight, God has a plan, and God has a people. Don't make decisions in the midst of discouragement. You'll end up making the wrong decisions, like being hungry at the grocery store. Secondly, pour out your heart before the Lord. Don't keep it bottled up inside to fester and to boil over and to anger or bitterness of God. Start to talk to God about what's going on on the inside and pour out your heart before the Lord. And then finally, get going on the plan of God. When God reveals his word, now faith comes in and you can get going on what God has for your life. Look at the things which are not seen rather than the things which are seen. Tonight, I'd like to pray for anybody in this place who's going through a problem, a trial. Maybe you're discouraged in this place, and you just want to take a moment in the presence of God. If that's you, would you just stand to your feet, and let's pray for you tonight. Just here in the presence of God. If Joel or Jared is around, would you guys come? There comes Jared. Tonight, you're discouraged, and you just want a, a special prayer tonight. Believe that God wants to impart grace, strength for your situation. Believe that tonight, if you listen, God will reveal to you the plan. Maybe he'll reveal to you the people. Maybe some of you are ready to make the wrong decision tonight. I believe that God will make that evident and show you what the right decision is. Let's pray together. Father, I just lift up each and every one of these that's standing in your presence tonight, God. Every single one of them dealing with discouragement, God, you know intimately their situation. You know their life. You know their story. And God, if you were to ask them, what are you doing here? Standing. God, they could pour out their hearts, and I believe that they'll take time to do that, Lord, later on. But tonight, you already know their story. So God, right now, I pray in the name of Jesus that you impart your wisdom. You give direction, Lord. You speak comfort, peace, encouragement. Father, that you impart grace. Strengthen them in their inner man. Father, reveal your plan. God, tell them about the people, the process, the provision. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Just listen for his voice right now. Just take a moment. God just spoke something to your heart. Just take a moment, write that down. Would you just take a moment and write down whatever God spoke to you? Because I know for me, if I don't write it down, I'll forget. Just take a moment. Those of you that are standing, maybe you're sitting and God spoke something to you right now. Write it down. Go ahead. If you need to get into your purse, you need to grab your Bible, whatever you need to do, write it down. Maybe get out your phone, put a note. Just commit it to somewhere that you can be accountable to what God has spoken to you. Because when God gives you a plan, it's time to get going. Maybe you're here with your spouse or a, a close, faith-filled friend, and you just want to tell them what God spoke to you for accountability. Would you hold me to this? Would you make sure to follow up with me about this? Just whisper it in their ear right now. If you're here with a, a spouse or a faith-filled friend that you know you want to be accountable to them, just whisper it in their ear right now and let them know what God spoke to you and ask them to hold you accountable to that. Maybe you want to put a time frame on it. Say, I need to do this by next week, next month. Father, we're grateful tonight and we receive your word with meekness. God, we thank you, Lord, that those that are standing tonight received your grace and your goodness into their lives. Lord, those that are seated as well, God, as we go through problems, as we go through trials and discouragements, God, you're with us. Lord, help us to make the right decisions in the midst of any problem, any trials or any discouragement, God. Father, may we just feel that freedom to pour out our hearts. May our prayer lives grow deeper and deeper with you, God. And Father, as we do, would you share and reveal your plans? May we get going on the things that you've called us to. 
In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement. We say amen. Can anybody give the Lord a praise for what you got from God tonight? Hallelujah. Hallelujah.